Thank you, choir, orchestra, and Bob Hand for leading us today. How important is personal evangelism? Well, according to Christianity Today, uh, in a research uh, poll they took on the question of the importance of personal evangelism, 87% of their readers, now this is Christians that primarily read this magazine, 87% of the readers polled said that every Christian's responsibility is to share their faith. In other words, 87% of the people said every Christian should share their faith. But according to George Barna, only 55% of Christians shared their faith in the last 12 months. 45% of us have not shared our faith in the last 12 months. In other words, there's a disconnect between what we say that we believe and what we actually practice when it comes to the subject of personal witnessing, sharing, and evangelism. Now, when we think of evangelism, we may think of Billy Graham or, or Greg Laurie, or maybe you've got some image in your mind uh, when you think of evangelism of some weird person you've seen in TV or some strange situation. But evangelism is literally the Greek word which means good news. It's not strange. It's not unusual. In fact, the English word gospel is merely the translation that the English translates this word, you angelio, good news evangelism. And it is every believer's responsibility to share the good news. Maybe you saw that Time Magazine article back uh, in April of 2011 that talked about the 911 emergency infrastructure in the United States and how woefully out of date it has become. You know, where you dial 911 and an operator comes on the line and you're able to get some immediate emergency response, some emergency help. Well, the reason that that is out of date is simply this. The 911 system was developed in 1968 and it is based on a landline telephone line. And uh, the operator is able to see immediately, if you call from a landline, they're able to identify your address immediately. The problem is, as we all know, most of us don't use a landline much, if at all. In fact, I know many people today who are getting rid of the landline altogether or don't have it when they get into a new apartment for any reason. Why should we? We've got cell phones. Here's the problem. When you dial 911, the operator has absolutely no idea where you are located. And since sometimes people call who are frantic, they're nervous, they're anxious, they're hurt, they're semi-conscious, they're lost, they're broken down, or they're away from home, they may not know how to tell where they are. Or a child may call, or someone may call who cannot, con who cannot you know, tell the person, the operator, where they're located. And so the emergency 911 system is a woefully inadequate infrastructure for emergency response today. And so the Time Magazine article concluded that today, in the absence of great technology or a better technology, the most important thing today is not the technology, but the human component. The ability and the creativity of that human operator to calm that other person on the other line, to try and talk to them, to try to determine where they're located if they cannot identify their location immediately. Otherwise, the 911 call is irrelevant. Isn't it interesting that here in the 21st century, our technology has led us to the point that it's a human being that really makes the difference. And you know, evangelism is the same way. When you and I think about evangelism, we may think, well, that's the pastor's job. That's the youth minister's job. That's uh, a crusade evangelist like Greg Laurie's job. Or uh, there'll be a good Christian movie come out. Or maybe there'll be a Christian TV program. And all those things play a role. But if you and I are going to reach your family members, your neighbors, your friends, then all of us must accept the responsibility of personal evangelism and personal evangelism evangelism must be just that, personal evangelism. And this morning, as we conclude our study in the book of Acts, we've been in it for 13 months. Today, we come to the last verses of the book of Acts. I want us to look at the subject, 
personal evangelism today. Would you open your Bibles with me, please, to Acts the 28th chapter. Acts 28. And I want us to begin reading in verse 23. They arranged to meet Paul on a certain day and came in even larger numbers to the place where he was staying. From morning to evening... He explained and declared to them the kingdom of God and tried to convince them about Jesus from the law of Moses and from the prophets. Some were convinced by what he said, but others would not believe. Let me pause. The group that didn't believe was much larger than the group that did. You say, how do you know that? By the outcome. If a large group would have believed, why, that would have been revival. But obviously, you can tell by the next verses that the larger group did not believe. Keep reading. Verse 25. They disagreed among themselves and began to leave after Paul had made this final statement. The Holy Spirit spoke the truth to your forefathers when he said through Isaiah the prophet, Go to this people and say, You will ever be hearing but never understanding. You will ever be seeing, but never perceiving. For this people's heart has become callous. They hardly hear with their ears. They have closed their eyes. Does that not sound like American culture today? They've heard it. As a matter of fact, do you know there are more born-again Christians in the United States than in any other nation in the world? And yet, look at our culture. Look at the mess that we're in today. Our culture has been deluged with the truth of the gospel, and yet we have more born-again Christians than any other nation, but we have a rise of atheism and cults and other religion or no religion at all. And look at what the Bible says about people. They've heard, but they don't listen. They see, but they don't really see. And they have thought about it, but it hasn't really sunk into their hearts. And the Bible says... Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and I would heal them. Paul said, therefore, I want you to know that God's salvation has been sent to the Gentiles, and they will listen. For two whole years, Paul stayed there in his own rented house and welcomed all who came to see him boldly and without hindrance. He preached the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, the reality is there are 7 billion people on this planet. And when you look at how most of them are not born again, and you may say, well, pastor, the job is too big. Well, I want to remind you, it is a big job. It's getting bigger all the time. But let me encourage you with one simple truth. Uh, a principle that I heard a, a pastor say one time, I'll never forget. He said, I can't reach everybody everywhere, but I can reach somebody somewhere. And the reality is you may not be able to fly out to L.A. and reach the hell's angels today. You may not be able to get into a debate with Richard Dawkins or one of these top atheists that are going around the country convincing so many people that there's no God. But maybe there's a little child that calls you grandma that you could convince. Maybe somebody calls you dad. Maybe there is a, a buddy that you go to the uh, links with and swing the clubs with once a week who you could talk to about Jesus. Maybe there's going to be somebody who has always loved you and looked up to you, and you'll see them at a family reunion, or you'll be able to give them a call, or in some way you'll be able to talk to a coworker who would be wide open because even though you can't reach everybody everywhere, you can reach somebody somewhere. And the reality is, when it comes right down to it, personal evangelism has got to be just that. It's got to be personal evangelism. It's got to be you and me reaching the people near to us. Now, look at this. We've been looking for weeks at Paul's desire to get to Rome. Well, he is in Rome. The gospel of, uh, I mean, the book of Acts ends in Rome. Paul is in, on, in house arrest. He's got his own little place and uh, 
What is the first thing he does? Well, he's there on trial, and yet the first thing he does, he contacts the Jewish leaders in Rome and asks them to come see him. In other words, the people that are the most like him, the people that he has the most contact with, he gets in uh, the most uh, in common with, he gets in touch with them. They come to see him, and he tells them, look, guys, I'm here to talk to you about Jesus and the kingdom of God. The thing that impresses me so much is that Paul's first response, his first thing that he did was try to set up an evangelistic opportunity with the Jewish leaders in the city of Rome. I used to have a plaque in my office that simply said this, the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. And the reality is, just like we saw this young adult baptized this morning who gave his life to Christ last week, the main thing of the church is one more person coming to Jesus to give their life to Christ. You say, but what about my needs? Well, we're going to take care of you. But what is the ultimate objective of helping you grow in Christ? What is the end result of you being stronger in the Lord? You say, feed me. No. Listen, we're called sheep. The animal that lives to eat is a pig, not a sheep. Your objective in the Christian life is not to grow more, just to get bigger or deeper or wider or sweeter. Your objective as a disciple is to reproduce, to be like Jesus. He said, I didn't come to be served, but to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. And the ultimate objective of the Christian life is to be like him and Bible study and prayer and fellowship and worship and tithing and giving and serving and all those things are like Jesus but until you and I reproduce in like kind and become soul winners and personal witnesses you and I are not really living the Christian life as it was designed to be lived the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing and the main thing is to take this gospel to one more person before Jesus comes again. And Paul's desire to reach others for Christ is a model and is an example for us. And you may say, well, Pastor, I don't know if you've noticed, but it's not easy out there. Well, I have noticed that. In fact, I've never seen a time when there was more stacked against us than today. And I've never known a time in my Christian experience when it was harder to share the good news than it is today. But if you've got a family member or a friend who would go to hell without Jesus, isn't a little effort on your part worth it? Aren't they worth it? Absolutely. So how are we going to do it? Well, let me share with you a couple principles that grow out of this last section of the book of Acts. Principle number one, personal evangelism today meets skepticism with Scripture. Personal evangelism today meets skepticism with Scripture. Look at verse 23. They arranged to meet Paul on a certain day and came in even larger numbers to the place where he was staying. Now watch this. This is my kind of preaching. From morning till evening, he explained and declared to them the kingdom of God. Now that's a sermon. You think I preach long sermons. I only go for an hour and a half, two hours. This guy was going all day. <laughs> no, I'm not going to go that long. Amen. Don't get in revival. <laughs> Paul, how'd you like Paul for pastor? He preached from morning till night. From morning to evening. He declared and explained to them the kingdom of God and tried to convince them about Jesus. Now watch this. From the law of Moses and from the prophets. Personal evangelism today meets skepticism with Scripture. I like what Greg Laurie once said. God's word is our primary weapon in evangelism. It is not designed to destroy life, but to give it. And you say, well, I understand that we're supposed to use the Bible. And, uh, you know, and Paul even said in Ephesians chapter 6 that the 
Word of God is the sword of the Spirit. But pastor, I'm witnessing to a family member or a friend who doesn't believe the Bible. Well, I love what Greg Laurie says in his follow-up in uh, saying that the Scripture is our ultimate weapon. He said, let's say that a, a, a soldier in olden times goes into battle and he's got his sword and his opponent comes up to him and says, I don't believe that sword is sharp. I don't believe that sword will hurt me. Matter of fact, I don't even believe you have a sword. He said, what's one way to convince him? Not explain to him how the sword was made. Not to show him how the sword looks in the light. Stick him with it. Now, that's not to suggest that the Bible is going to hurt somebody. But the point is, if somebody doesn't believe the Bible, give them more of it. Because there's only, and you say, are you joking me? No, I'm absolutely serious. There's only one thing in this world that God has promised to bless, and that is his own word. He said, my word will not return to me void. It will accomplish the matter for which it has been sent out. Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away. That means everything you and I can come up with, every invention of the postmodern mind, every ingenious trick or gimmick that somebody has come up with, one of these days is going to be dissolved and eradicated. Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will never pass away. The Bible says the, the grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And the Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And brothers and sisters, you just think about it. You think about it. You didn't have to be a Baptist to get saved. You didn't have to be an American to get saved. You didn't have to be white to be saved. You didn't have to be a man to be saved. You didn't have to be a boy or a girl. You didn't have to be uh, speak English. You didn't have to watch a television program about Jesus. You may have not even been saved in a church. But if you've been born again, somebody shared the Word of God with you, and that's how you got saved. Because you can get saved whether you're a Baptist or a non-Baptist. You can get saved whether you're in a church or not in a church. You can get saved you're a man or a woman, black, white, Latino, Asian, European. You can get saved if you never spoke a word of English. You can get saved if you're 9 years old or 90 years old. But you can't get saved without the Word of God. Somebody had to explain to you that Jesus died on a cross and rose from the dead. And so, child of God, I, you may be talking to someone that doesn't believe the Word of God. Well, let me tell you something. Just keep telling them. Just keep telling them. And notice what the Scripture says. From morning to night, he explained. Now, that word explain means he laid it out. It literally means to set out. Have you ever bought something that had... On the outside of the box, some assembly required. And when you get it home, a lot of times there'll be a little plastic bag full of wing nuts and bolts and screws and little plastic objects you can't identify and never saw before in your life. And then you've got to figure out, do I need a Phillips head, a flat head? Do I need a saw? Do I need a razor blade, a hammer? Do I need a scrub brush, a bucket? What do I need? So before you start the project, how many of you know you got to lay out all those pieces? Make sure you got enough wing nuts, enough screws, enough bolts. Make sure you got a flathead, a Phillips head. That's exactly what this word explain means. Paul laid it out. He took the word of God layer by layer, word by word, line by line, paragraph by paragraph, and he just laid it out there and explained it to where they could understand it. And then lest we think that this was some cold theological discussion, notice the Bible says he explained it, and in verse 23 says he declared to them the kingdom of God. That word declared is the Greek word dia maturiomai. Dia means through, like diagram, diatribe, diagonal. Dia means through. And marturiomai, from the Greek word marturos or marturio, means a martyr or a, a witness willing to give everything he has for what he knows to be true. So Paul wasn't just, you know, giving them some cold theological discussion. He poured his life into what he was saying. He believed it. 
And notice the Bible says he, look at verse 23, he explained it and he declared to them and he tried to convince them. You see that in the NIV? He tried to convince them. That's that Greek word pytho. We get a word pathos, passion. This wasn't just some cold, indifferent, kind of, you know, boring, monotone discussion. No, he was on fire trying to explain to them the kingdom of God and all about Jesus. And how did he do it? Notice verse 23, by describing to them the law of Moses and the prophets. Now, what is the law of Moses and the prophets? Well, that's just shorthand for saying the 39 books of the Old Testament. In fact, it was one of Luke's most favorite descriptions of the Old Testament itself. I want you, if you've got your Bible, turn to the book of Luke, chapter 24, Luke's other book, his first volume, volume 1, the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24, and look at verse 25 for just a moment. I've got to hurry. But I want to show you this. You can study it a little more closely later. But this is Jesus on the road to Emmaus. How many of you remember that story? Jesus has been raised from the dead, and he's appeared that Sunday afternoon, that first Easter Sunday. He has appeared to a couple of his disciples on the road to Emmaus. And remember, they did not recognize him. I don't know why. The Bible doesn't tell us why. The Bible merely says they didn't recognize him. You can uh, insert your own explanation for why. But the bottom line is they didn't recognize him. But notice what the Bible says in verse 25. Jesus is speaking to these disciples on the road to Emmaus. And he said to them, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Now watch this. Look what Luke says about what happened next. And beginning with Moses and all the prophets... He explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. In other words, the law of the Moses and the prophets is just another way of describing Genesis through Malachi, what we call the Old Testament, the only scriptures they had at the time. Listen to me. The Bible says that Jesus explained in that walk from Jerusalem to that neighboring city called Emmaus, Jesus explained everything that is written in the Old Testament about him from Jerusalem. Genesis all the way to Malachi. I, I like what one preacher said, take away my Bible, but give me that sermon. But I want to show you something else. Look at, just turn the page and look at verse 44 of chapter 24 of Luke. Look at Luke chapter 24, verse 44. This is Jesus appearing now to his apostles sometime later. He said to them, this is what I told you while I was still with you, that is, before the crucifixion. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. And that three-part designation is the way that the Jews describe their Bible. The three categories of the Old Testament, Law of Moses, Prophets, and Psalms, which included the Song of Solomon, Proverbs, Book of Ecclesiastes, the wisdom literature. But this was their shorthand definition. Jesus said, everything that is said about me in the Law of Moses, the Prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Now look at verse 45. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. And he told them, this is what is written. In other words, Jesus is about to explain the Old Testament. He said, this is what is written. The Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. And repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations. Beginning at Jerusalem, you are witnesses of these things. Now look at Acts chapter 28. The Bible says that Paul brought those Jewish people in and he began to explain to them the kingdom of God beginning at the law of Moses and the prophets. In other words, the word of God. And what was their response? Well, most of them didn't believe it. And you say, well, pastor, doesn't that prove, doesn't that demonstrate that that was the wrong strategy? You know, to say that preaching the Word of God does not convince everybody and therefore we ought not preach the Word of God is like saying it ought to be against the law to shoot people in a crowded theater and then people wouldn't do it. There are laws in Colorado about killing people. 
But that didn't stop an insane, demon-possessed maniac from doing it, did it? How many times do we have to learn that no matter how many laws men pass, some lawbreaker will find a way to violate those laws? You can send your congressman or your senator back to Washington or over here to Austin to pass every law you want to see passed, and I guarantee you some madman will break that law because it is only the power of God that changes the human heart. And you say, where was God in Aurora? Same place you would have been, trying to tell that man, don't do it. But he did it anyway because he's a madman and a coward and sick and evil. The reality is, my brothers and sisters, that to say because some people don't believe the Word of God, we won't preach the Word of God, is foolishness. The response of this crowd was to the majority of them did not believe. So what did Paul do? He gave them more Scripture. You say, what are you talking about? Look at verse 25. Look at verse 25. They disagreed among themselves and began to leave after Paul had made this final statement. The Holy Spirit spoke the truth to your forefathers when he said through Isaiah the prophet, go to this people and say, you will ever be hearing but never understanding. You will ever be seeing but never perceiving. For this people's heart has become callous. They hardly hear with their ears and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts and turn and I would heal them. In other words, Paul had given them scripture all day long and they said well we just don't believe it so what did he do he gave them more scripture and by the way this passage of scripture that I've just read to you is a quotation from Isaiah chapter 6 verses 9 and 10 it's found seven times in the Bible once in Isaiah once in Matthew once in Mark once in Luke once in John once in Acts and once in Romans this is one of the most powerful scriptures in the Bible. And what does it say? The Bible says the reality is the more we preach, the more we're going to find unresponsive hearts because men grow hard against the gospel. Seven times we're told that when we preach the truth, men will close their eyes and their minds and their hearts to the truth. And you say then, Pastor, why do we still preach it? Look at verse 25. Look at what Paul said. The Holy Spirit was right when he said through Isaiah the prophet. Here's why we preach it. Because this book was written by the Holy Spirit. And this is the sword of the Spirit. And child of God, let me tell you something. He knows how to convince the human heart through his word. And he has not promised to convince anybody through any other method other than through his own word. I was reading this week a book by the late Bill Bright, the founder of Campus Crusade. And he was on a campus uh, evangelizing and sharing the faith one day when a Marxist student came up to him. And he was very opposed to Bill Bright being on campus evangelizing. And this Marxist said, I don't agree with you being here. I don't think you have any right to try and convince these students of what you believe. And Bill Bright said, well, let me share with you this scripture. And he said, just stop. He said, I don't even believe the Bible. So he said, you're wasting your time. So Bill Bright said, well, let me ask you this. Would you be willing to come to my house for dinner tonight? My wife will fix us both dinner. We'll all sit down and eat, and just the three of us, and we'll discuss the world and what we think about it, and uh, you can tell me what you believe, and I can tell you what I believe. How does that sound? And somehow he convinced that student to come over to his house that night. And if they had a good dinner, uh, the, Bill Bright said, well, tell me a little bit about what you believe, and he ranted on about the Communist Manifesto and all of that. And then Bill Bright said, could I tell you why I believe that Jesus Jesus is my Savior? And he said, well, sure, go ahead. And Bill Bright said, well, would it be okay if I showed you the scriptures that gave me that conclusion? And then if you have any questions about those scriptures, I'll be happy to answer the questions as I try to explain it. And the student said, sure, that'll be fine. Now, quite honestly, I, I thought when I was reading that story in Bill Bright's book, I thought he was going to share with him John 3, 16 and then drop the hammer and give him an invitation. <laughs> I, I, I mean, really... In the book, 
Bill Bright lists as a reference every scripture that he gave that student that night, and it is two pages front and back of scripture references that he laid on that Marxist student that night. And the student would argue with the scriptures, and Bill Bright would explain, and then he'd move to the next scripture. And guess what happened at the end of the night? I think you know where this story is headed. That Marxist student gave his life to Jesus Christ. And may I share something with you by way of testimony? I've been preaching this book and sharing this gospel for 35 years. I'm the first one to tell you you can't win them all because if you could win them all, I'd have done it by now. You can't win them all. You can't win them all. But I share this by way of testimony. In 35 years, I've seen thousands of people give their lives to Jesus Christ. I've seen atheists give their life to Jesus. I had a, I've, had, I've seen devil worshipers. I was in a preaching revival in Ohio, and a girl came in who told me up front, I'm a worshiper of the high Lord Satan. And I said, well, come on in and hear about Jesus. And that night she gave her life to Christ. Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, any other religion you want to say that means lost, every person that's been on drugs, every pornographer, adulterer, uh, unbelievers of every kind, men, women, young person, people from other nationalities, people that did, I couldn't even speak their language. I had to use some kind of translator. I have seen people around the world in Bethlehem, Israel, and uh, in Alaska, Kentucky, Texas, Colorado, Ohio, all over the place where I preach, I've seen people give their life to Christ. And may I say this, I cannot explain to you how these people came to Christ except this book as the Word of God. And you say, well, pastor, it's because you're such a phenomenal speaker. That's hogwash and you know it. You cannot talk a person out of drugs. You cannot talk a person out of adultery. You cannot talk a person out of Satanism. You cannot talk a person out of atheism. It is the Word of God that has a power, and I have seen it in my own experience for 35 years, and we will see it again because this book is the book written by the Holy Spirit of God. And brothers and sisters, it's not, a just, it's not just about the preacher because, listen, every member is a minister. And if you and I are going to see our neighbors and friends and family members come to Christ, then I want to give you a quick list of things. Write this down. Here's a quick list of things you need to do about the Bible in order to really be effective when your moment and your opportunity comes. I read a great thing on Twitter this week. By the way, if you're not following me on Twitter... You need to jump on the tweet train. <laughs> Victory is hundred hour, hundreds of hours of preparation meeting one moment of opportunity. Victory is hundreds of hours of preparation meeting a single moment of opportunity. Here's the things you've got to do as a man or a woman, as a young person who loves the Lord and wants the opportunity to make a difference for Christ, here are the things you have to do with the Word of God in order to be effective in sharing the Word of God. Number one, get in a church that believes the Bible. Now let me say that even a different way. Not everybody here is a member of Hyde Park or the Quarries Church. In fact, some people listening to me today by television or on the internet, uh, you'll never be a member of Hyde Park or the Quarries Church. Maybe some of you sitting here. Now, I wish that everybody would join Hyde Park or the Quarries Church. But I know that not everybody will. So let me make this very clear. Even though some of you may never join this church, if you are a member of a church that does not, or if you are attending, attending a church that does not believe the Bible, does not teach the Bible, does not preach the Bible, let me make this very, very clear. Get out of that church. Leave it and go to a church that believes and practices the Word of God. And you say, Pastor, I can't believe that you said that. Do you know this world is flaming into hell and we are not going to sit by and watch it happen and be afraid to say what's the truth? Do you all understand that the truth is just the truth? 
And you may say, well, I'm going to stay in this church even though I believe the Bible. I'm going to stay in this church that doesn't believe the Bible because I'm going to make a difference. Let the dead bury the dead. Go ask Lot's wife how effective you are in a culture that is completely corrupt when you're the one. The Bible says that of Lot that his righteous soul was vexed by living in that culture and that community. You say, are you, are you being ugly? No. I'm just telling you the truth. Do not expose your conscience do not expose your children or your grandchildren or your witness to a church that doesn't believe the Bible or teach the Bible. Get out of that church and don't go back. Now, I would invite you to join this church, but let me remind you, every great church in Austin is a Bible-believing church. Every growing church in Austin is a Bible-believing church. And if you don't come to this church, go to one of those churches, but get out of those churches that don't believe anything. Matter of fact, if you were following me on Twitter, you'd know. <laughs> I retweeted a New York Times article last week. New York Times. Now, everybody knows that the New York Times is one of the most prestigious liberal newspapers in the United States. There are other documents that are probably worse, but none are more well-known or more uh, often read than the New York Times. It is a liberal publication, and nobody doubts that. Last week, the New York Times read, ran an article entitled, Can Religious Churches Be Saved? And the reason for it is very simple. This New York Times writer, he's not writing as a Christian. This wasn't Christianity today. He was saying the liberal churches across this United States, regardless of the denomination, that are buying in to every liberal concept and every worldly concept that comes down the road, they are dying because they do not believe their Bibles anymore. They don't preach their Bibles anymore, so they just teach whatever the world teaches. They adopt to try and uh, salvage a few members. And you may say, Pastor, do you know what city you live in? Yes, hallelujah, this is where the Holy Ghost sent me. <laughs> because God doesn't need any dead churches. God does, the world doesn't need churches that don't believe the word of God. Lost people don't need churches like that. Friend, when I was lost, I didn't need any kind of church. Surely not a dead church. Number one, get out of a dead church and join a church that believes the Bible. Number two, read and study the Bible every single day so that you know what the Bible says. Number three, memorize the Word of God. Memorize the Word of God. You say, Pastor, I, I can't memorize anything. What's your phone number? What's your Social Security number? You can memorize things. The more time you spend in the Word of God, remember, victory is hundreds of hours of preparation combined with a single moment of opportunity. You just feed your soul with the Word of God, and you be ready when that moment of opportunity comes, and it will amaze you how the Holy Spirit will bring those verses and apply them to your life and to the lives of those around you. And then fourth, share it. Share it. Not just live it. Talk about it. Say it. When the opportunity comes to share the good news, you need to do it. Now, brothers and sisters, the reality is you and I can personally make a difference if you and I will share the Word of God with the people around us. Would you stand with me all over this place?